Hello, hello, and welcome to the first episode of what might become a series of recommending YouTube channels. If you remember on the previous account, we were doing the insane, tedious project of going through absolutely every single one of my subscriptions. I'm, I'm not really uh, looking forward to doing anything on that scale again. I think now I'm just going to focus on individual channels that I think are really interesting. And uh, this one is just beyond the pale. Uh, you really should watch Swampletics. In fact, I'm I'm demanding that you watch Swampletics. If you don't watch Swampletics, you can just unsubscribe from this channel. But what is Swampletics? What, what am I talking about? What is this blurry video game, man? So, uh, Swampletics is a series of videos documenting this old-school RuneScape player settled. He's attempting this really insane challenge account. There's no banking, so you can only just carry the, the small grid of items that are on you. No trading, nothing with any other players or like the, the auction house. And he's locking himself to only one region of the game, one kind of tiny subcontinent. Uh, it's the spooky, swampy, Halloweeny place of Mauritania. Uh, his goal is to beat the hardest boss in this region, which is also one of the hardest bosses in just the game overall. Uh, it started as just kind of like a simple documentation of, of how this journey was going and what sort of things he was doing. Uh, before this, he had done a similar series where he didn't lock himself in just one region, but he still did the no banking, no trading challenges uh, and maxed out all of his stats on the account. And I've heard that series is pretty interesting too, but I haven't gotten around to watching it yet. It's... It's evolved to so much more than that, though. I, I think this is one of the true masterpieces of YouTube right now. Um, so what if you don't know anything about RuneScape? Like, what if this explanation so far has just barely made sense and you don't know the first thing about this game? Well, I would say this is actually, like, the best intro you could ever hope for to have for RuneScape. I went in with basically no knowledge of the game whatsoever, just kind of the basic understanding of what it was. I wouldn't trade the experience of watching Swampletics uh, with this total lack of, of previous knowledge for anything. It's the, the first few episodes, of course, were just kind of like a fever dream. I really didn't know much about what was going on. What, what it felt like was, <laughs> have you ever had like a little kid try to explain a video game they've been playing to you? And it just really doesn't make sense to go in. Well, first I killed like a million zombie chickens. And then I went to this ghost city and I got I got this like ghost money from them. And then there's this big bridge out in the swamp. I had to jump over it over and over and over again. And you're like, yeah, okay, sure, kid. Um, but then you start kind of slowly working out. What is he doing? What is the significance of this? Why why is he bothering with all of this stuff? It's It's kind of a fun puzzle to work out why everything is happening. Um, there's a certain flatness to the old school RuneScape UI that makes this a lot easier. Like when he's looking at his stats, you can see all of his stats laid out there in helpful grid. When he looks at his inventory, you know that's his entire inventory plus his equipment. Um, everything you do in the game is just like clicks, pop-up menus, uh, things that you type in, selections that pop up. There's nothing hidden happening. There's no uh, hotkeys that he's pressing that you're kind of obscured to. So you can work out, just by careful study of the videos, what is going on, bit by bit. Um, so not only did I have this experience of learning about Swampletics, going in pretty much totally blind, and completely loving this, this learning curve, uh, but a, a friend of mine, whom I recommended this series to, also went through the same thing, and can also vouch for, for how great an experience it is. Um, maybe we're both just weirdos, though? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but then, for probably if you're watching this video, you might be that type of weirdo, too. Uh, what's key, I think, is that he always makes clear the significance of what he's doing. Even if you don't understand the, the mechanical details behind it, you know when it's a big deal. You know when it's like, oh, this is the payoff he's been working for. Those things are made immediately obvious, even to the most uninformed viewer. So what kind of content are we actually working through here? Why is this so engaging? I'd say the first big part of it is the pen and coic appeal. So if you don't know pen and coic, he's the Super Mario 64 A button challenge guy. Um, there's a few people working on this project, but pen and coic is by far the most devoted to trying to figure out how much you can do in Mario 64 without pressing A, without jumping. 
So you might recognize him from the uh, ridiculously at this point played out memes of, you know, half an A-press and the parallel universes and stuff. If you don't know what any of this means, you should go check that out too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all working with this deep and obscure knowledge of just the, the most edge cases in the game. The, the most trivial details that end up having importance. Synthesizing all of this obscure knowledge together to come up with uh, solutions to problems that you're having. You're drawing upon generations of community knowledge, seeking out experts in, in certain areas of the game and, and consulting fan wikis that have been built up over years and years and years. And then it all leads to these really brilliant aha moments that not just solve the problem at hand, but open the door to broader applications of kind of strategies and ways of thinking that you come up with. Um, it's it's really just such a, a an involving process, so engrossing to to learn about this stuff and to learn about what kind of creative work is being done behind it. There's a big difference though. <laughs> uh, Pan and Koic comes up with the solution. He writes a script to execute those commands into Mario 64. And then he just kind of walks away, and the emulator plays out the scenario. Um, whereas the Swamp Man here, Swampletics, has to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours actually executing these clever solutions that he's come up with to his problems. So, you know, it's, that's kind of a big difference. I'd say the other big chunk of appeal is the Fukumoto appeal. So this is the mangaka that made Kaiji and Akagi and a lot of other manga that revolve around gambling and games of chance and kind of strategic chance. Uh, he's done all sorts of uh, manga outside of that genre too. Probably if you've uh, watched videos on this channel before, you're, you're at least like vaguely familiar with, the, with this guy. It's, it's the Zawa Zawa guy, <laughs> if you know that meme. Uh, so Old School RuneScape has a lot of RNG, uh, random number generation, i.e events that are just purely up to luck, mostly in fights, uh, but especially in loot drop tables. So like when you kill monsters, you get some rewards, or you do various other things and you get rewards, or just randomly rewards will pop up. And uh, the likelihood of getting the rewards you want are sometimes just vanishingly small. So um, he really does a good job setting up this aspect of the game. You, you know what his goals are. You know what items he's hoping to see. You know the likelihood of those items showing up. You know the investment that he has to put into each and every roll on that table, uh, each and every spawn of that item. Um, and so you too can get very, very invested in these critical moments where the item spawns, seeing what it is. It, it's very, very thrilling. Um, just being there along with him, knowing what this would represent if he got the item he wants. Um, and moreover, it, it actually somehow reaches this kind of deep human feeling that Fukumoto gets. And, and this I don't know if I can explain too well. Um, on the Fukumoto side, you get into these really intense gambling situations uh, where so, so much is on the line. Money, blood, entire lives. Uh, they're trying to work out um, the psychology of their opponent, our, our protagonists. And then it starts to fall into this really wonderful kind of psychological introspective space where we're not just asking questions about how likely is it that he has the ace, but what would he mean to be a human and to hold an ace in this situation? What does it mean to be throwing ourselves into games like this? What are we hoping for? What does this mean if we win? Um, all of these kind of greater philosophical questions that often aren't so much explicitly asked, but just sort of invoked in the depth of emotion. Um, and here, I, I get the same sensation. I start to feel that same kind of depth of humanity coming through in these desperate gambles that he's making with his Swamp Man account. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's quite a profound feeling. Um, but again, there's a big, big difference in that Fukumoto is writing fiction. He's just coming up with stories about people gambling and stuff. But Swampletics, that's real life? <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to talk about this coherently, but I mean, if you're devoting hundreds and hundreds of hours to something to trying to get some random drop, and once you get it, you're freed from having to do that more and you can move on to other things, 
like that's a very real thing in your life like that's a very real change to your lifestyle that's brought about by this gameplay facet so it's <laughs> i mean it's not real life but it's the stakes are definitely real so this is all starting to kind of kind of torturous right like you're doing all of this hardcore creative work involving really deep synthesis of knowledge you're you're throwing yourselves into these ridiculous gambles hoping for astronomical odds to pay off and it's taking hundreds and hundreds of hours of your life of just playing this one game doing these same things over and over again that doesn't sound really all that fun um, but this is where the, the personality of Settled as a player really shines through in these videos. Uh, he really strikes a good balance, I think, between his a, different, a few different perspectives you can have on this whole adventure. Sometimes he's acknowledging kind of the hellishness of what he's signed up for. He'll make a lot of kind of self-deprecating jokes about, I must be crazy to be doing this. Um, at other times, though, he's embracing it wholeheartedly, and you can see that he really genuinely enjoys these types of grinds, and that um, probably just the way he goes about playing is, is a nice balance of relaxing and engaging for him, and it, it often seems like he's just on top of the world, uh, being Swampletics. And there's such a deep celebration, in, in, especially in moments where he, he finishes a grind, where he finally gets the item he's been looking for, and then he's free from doing that activity. Um, and the, the moments of celebration there are just so wholehearted, so blossoming with just <laughs> freedom and happiness uh, that it's, it's quite infectious, it's quite wonderful. Other times there's extreme self-awareness of the very happiness that he's working so hard to achieve. And here, of course, I'm referring to like the dopamine meme, um, where uh, I think the first time I can remember hearing it is uh, there is this very tedious thing he was doing to get experienced homes, uh, which are books that will just give you a bunch of experience in whatever skill that book relates to. Uh, so he would gather big inventories of just these books uh, and then activate them all in rapid succession and just watching all of the EXP pop-ups scroll past. He would just talk about the dopamine that was like flooding through his body kind of taking a step back <laughs> and and being able to see on this more abstract chemical level like how the game was basically just manipulating him and, and how he was basically just kind of caught in this dopamine feedback loop, um, addicted to earning these EXP tomes. So there's such a self-awareness and yet it's still just a genuine joy that he's expressing and, and uh, that's motivating him to continue. So it's, it seems a little contradictory. It seems like maybe a, a, a confusing state of mind that he's in while he plays. Uh, but it all adds up to a really enjoyable viewing experience and, and one that seems to reflect all colors of what this experience must be like. It, ultimately, I would call this an absurdist series on, on every level. Um, on one hand, if you just look at literally what's happening, it's this old man who lives in a swamp uh, who is building himself up to unimaginably godlike levels, <laughs> just running around doing silly swamp things. But then on the other hand, equally true, it's this multi-thousand hour project to push the limits of possibility in the game, to push his own limits of, of patience and fortitude. Uh, and it's both these things simultaneously and so many other things in between too. And each one of them is just kind of more absurd than the last. There's no real perspective you can get on this where it kind of makes sense. <laughs> uh, so in the end, I'd like to take a, an absurdist perspective, I guess, on this as a project that one must imagine Swampletics happy. And here, of course, I'm referencing Camus' uh, legendary The Myth of Sisyphus, uh, Sisyphus, of course, the, uh, the legendary Greek figure who was punished by the gods to roll a boulder up a hill, and then the boulder rolls back down the hill. And then you have to roll the boulder back up the hill, and then the roll boulder rolls back down the hill. And uh, this is just kind of the exemplar, uh, and a Sisyphusian task is just an impossible task that nevertheless you've been set upon to do. Um, 
So Camus, in, in this big climactic moment of his book, says that uh, man can fill his heart wholly, or a person can fill their heart wholly, uh, simply from the task itself, simply from just the experience of pushing that boulder up the hill. Uh, and that one must imagine that Sisyphus is happy doing this, that this is kind of the only way we can make sense of this world. Or, or not even, it's not even about making sense, because in the end it is about absurdity. But it's, <laughs> I don't know, it, it's, <laughs> we're getting into some pretty deep philosophical topics here. But the point is, well, one must imagine Swamp Lettuck's happy as well. <laughs> that even though he's, you know, however many hours into his temple trekking, no matter how many thousands of vampires he has to kill or implings he has to catch, one must imagine him happy. But from all of this comedy and tragedy, triumph emerges. And the feeling of, of escalation and achievement of goals being crossed off, new goals being written, and then those goals being crossed off, it's so uniquely powerful watching his account grow over these months and over all these videos. The sporadic release schedule, I think, actually adds a lot to this. Uh, so at the start of the series, the videos came out pretty consistently every week. Um, but now, as the major milestones are getting further and further apart, uh, the fact that he uploads based on hitting these milestones and achieving these goals makes the release schedule stretched out more and more over time. But that just kind of makes each video more precious. You get more invested in each one as you just look forward to them. It has a really good rhythm. It's not so far apart that you're ever totally uh, f forgotten about it. You've never like completely removed it from your kind of active mind. Um, but it is so far apart that each video is just such a cause for, for celebration. Uh, what I've, I've really latched on to, um, and this is something my, my friend that I showed this series to uh, really liked as well and pointed out to me is, one scene where he's just unlocked some big bit of content. I don't really remember what. I think he finished a big quest, uh, which allows for a bunch of other quests and minigames and stuff. And he says really excitedly, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. Um, and we, we both found this like really inspirational, that if you just kind of reframe things in your life, not as like, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, oh, I have this gigantic to-do list, but that there's so much to do, that... If Swampletics can have this attitude towards multi-hundred-hour tedious grinds, then certainly we can try to have such a bright and positive attitude towards grocery shopping or doing the laundry or whatever. There's so much to do, you know? We, we have all of these experiences laid out before us. And, and why not try to cherish each one? Why not try to see the experience that we gain and, and the things we unlock by doing them? Uh, probably the thing that thrills me, uh, s not the most, but like, I think is one of the more obviously engaging things about the series is how good the production quality is getting. As I said, it started off as just sort of clips documenting what was happening, maybe with like a few graphics and such, but now we're getting like skits and big music video montages and just like some really sublime choices in terms of like editing and pacing and big reveals and stuff. Uh, he's really grown into this amazing directorial role where you can tell he's not seeing it just as this challenge account anymore, not just as Swamp Lettuce, the RuneScape character, but as this amazing multimedia project uh, that reflects things happening within this game but then also can perfectly well stand alone just as a series of engaging videos. I, I can't imagine like how crazy it's going to get by the end. But the end is approaching. We're entering the end game. There's only a few more goals he has left before he's going to challenge this final boss arena. So I really recommend get on board with this. Uh, get caught up and, and get yourself ready to see the, the next episodes. I, I think it's something that's fantastic to watch as it airs when everything is still up in the air. We don't know if he can do it. There's people that are very skeptical that he'll be able to beat this boss just with what he's been able to achieve in this area. So we got to find out together, right? Like... <laughs> It's that same kind of everyone doesn't know spirit of reading like a manga as it comes out. But now even the creator doesn't know. We're, we're finding out along with Swampletics just how far he can go.
Ah, it's so great. Um, probably I'll make some more videos on this series in the future if people are interested. Uh, one idea I had was like a top 10 Swampletics moments uh, to do as like a kind of a recap of the series when it ends. So yeah, I just, I'm giving this my, my wholehearted recommendation. As someone who's only played RuneScape very briefly and knows still comparatively very little about it, um, I'm recommending it more as like a manga fan, as a fan of engaging fiction and engaging stories. I think this is just a, a fantastic in every regard, totally worth watching thing. So please check it out. Okay, I think that's all I had to say. Um, so yeah, I, I might do more videos about YouTube channels. Uh, there's some other things that I consider YouTube masterpieces that I'd like to highlight. So uh, let me know what you thought. Bye bye for now.